the heavens above and the earth beneath, the heavens above and the earth beneath, the Most High God, the Most High God. And God looked down upon the earth. God descended upon Mount Sinai. God came down upon Mount Sinai. Heavens above and the earth beneath. Ezekiel tells us that above the dome is the throne of Elohim, where God sits upon his throne. The earth is my footstool. In Isaiah, he says, the earth is my footstool. In the end of days, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6, I will say to the north, North Pole, give back. And to the south, South Pole, don't hold back. Bring back my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Shalom family. I put together these two videos, very, very difficult to find, especially the first video, because Google is openly censoring anything that questions the evolutionary sun god worship pagan model of the globe and the universe and so on. They are going out of their way to publicly declare they're constantly trying to uh, bury information that goes against the narrative. So I hope that you enjoyed these two presentations put together in one. If you really truly want to know how NASA came together and why NASA was put together and what was the reason for all of this, uh, please watch this video. Please hit the thumbs up button. The first one is involving what they call sky crystal, which I believe are pieces of the dome itself. And the reasons being is because of the ingredients that are contained within these crystals match what would be contained in the dome itself. And also, we cannot have gas pressure without a container, period. There's no going around that. So I hope you enjoy these two videos put together. Please like this uh, video and share it if you can. And please take the time to watch the entire thing as it will really, really benefit you to understand how we got to this point. Shalom. In 1990, an Italian geologist named Angelo Bittoni would find an unusual stone while visiting Sierra Leone, a mysterious artifact that has baffled all who have studied it. A local Fuller chief was said to have given it to Bittoni, a blue stone with mysterious white lines upon its surface. After returning to Europe, Pitoni took the stone to the Institute of Natural Sciences of Geneva and then University La Sapienza in Rome for further analysis. To his surprise, tests revealed that it was not a turquoise or indeed anything that could officially be identified. Furthermore, the blue stone didn't correspond to any known mineral. But the most intriguing thing is its color. Researchers still do not understand how the stone has acquired or retained its color. This even though several universities and laboratories have analyzed the artifact at great length. It seems its color remains a mystery. Mysteriously, at the University of Utrecht, the stone underwent several tests with use of strong acids, but none of the acids could affect the stone. It was even heated to over 3,000 degrees Celsius, yet its composition wasn't altered. When a small piece of the stone was pulverized and viewed under the microscope, it curiously lost its color. Now known as the Sky Stone, according to analysis, an amazing 77.17% of the stone is somehow made of pure oxygen. The remaining percentage was divided between carbon, calcium, and another unknown element. When researchers crushed a piece of the sky rock and mixed it with acetone, hexane, and methylene, and then enhanced the extractions with ultrasound, they were eventually able to locate an organic compound that is currently unknown to science. Dated at 55,000 years old, just what is the sky stone? How could it possibly be made mostly of oxygen? Is this stone a past remnant left by a once advanced civilization? Or maybe its origins are not even local to Earth. Amazingly, it seems that Pitoni's sky stone is not unique. There has in fact been similar finds in other places of the Earth, most notably Brazil. The other sample of sky stone was submitted to GRS Swiss Labs for testing and analysis by an anonymous dealer. Intrigued, 
American artist and designer Jared Collins tried to buy the small cutaway piece from the dealer so he could study it further, but the dealer refused to sell it. He wouldn't even name a price for the larger full stone. It seems there are indeed other exhibits of this curious stone made mostly of pure oxygen in existence, yet the mystery surrounding their makeup and origin persists to this day. Sarah von Braun ran NASA's Saturn rocket program for the first Mercury missions through the alleged Apollo missions to the moon. Just as NASA was beginning to be developed to allegedly counter the Russians, who were said to be the first in space resulting in the great space race, von Braun had plenty of time to go to Hollywood and collaborate with Paramount Pictures and Walt Disney to sell space travel to the public. Man of Space was the pre-programming of the public to accept vast sums of expenditures to counter the Cold War evil empire. It is common knowledge that before com coming to NASA, von Braun was the Wunderkind leader of the V-2 or Vengeance 2 rocket program for the Germans during World War II. According to a 2011 BBC documentary, the attacks resulted in the deaths of an estimated 9,000 civilians and military personnel, while 12,000 forced laborers and concentration camp prisoners were killed producing the weapons. So let's get back to the beginnings of NASA in 1958, where every photo and every story of space exploration has come from for over the past 50 years. The first NASA administrator in 1958 was Dr. Thomas Keith Glennon. Previously to NASA, he was the studio manager for 10 years at Paramount Studios in Hollywood. Then from 1942 to 47, he was the administrator and director of the U.S. Naval Underwater Sound Laboratory and then after the war was production manager for the photographic film manufacturing company ANSCO, also known as GAF. His work in movie making and underwater photography came in handy to fake the Apollo moon missions and spacewalks. Here is the massive underwater neutral buoyancy laboratory in Houston, Texas, which is said to facilitate astronauts with near weightlessness in space, but has actually has been used for decades to facilitate fake space moon footage. Secret societies have been part of the occult or hidden hand of preserving the great lie since the beginning. How cool or powerful it would be for secret society's recruiting purposes if you could tell your new first three-degree blue members that Buzz Aldrin, the second man we are sold had stepped on the moon, had planted a Scottish Rite Freemason flag on there. From George Washington and his laying of the cornerstones of the White House to many U.S. presidents like Harry S. Truman, many have been Freemasons. So to fake an Apollo moon landing, one Kenneth or Kenny S. Kleinecht managed manage the Apollo space missions from the beginning until retiring to Lockheed Corp. in 1981. He is a 33-degree Mason, and for his great work at NASA and the Apollo fake moon missions, he then became the sovereign grand commander and titular head of all Scottish Rite Masons throughout the world. Make no mistake, the powers that run NASA are co-joined, run, and controlled by the military and secret societies of the New World Order, and always have been in modern times. Using Hollywood, whose name comes from the holly tree used by the ancient Druids for black magic, as well as known celebrities to promote their sun-worshipping Horus snake ways, as they show off their serpent tongues to mock those without eyes to see or ears to hear the hidden truth about what is really going on in our world today. There is one more critical piece to the founding of NASA. Uh, Jack Whiteside Parsons, who uh, JPL, Jack Parsons Laboratories, was named, was considered the father of rocketry. Uh, also joining him were some very nefarious characters in the founding of NASA. 
Uh, we see the complete dream team here of Alistair Crowley, a very well-known occultist, dark magic, black magic person. Jack Parsons, who we just mentioned, R. Uh, Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard, founder of Scientology, Werner von Braun, uh, V2 rocket program, Nazi Germany, and the fantasy creator, Walt Disney. Now, looking at Whiteside Parsons, he was an occultist, black magician, satanic, uh, sata Satanist, head of Ordo Templi Orientis, California, Agape, Agape Lodge, Crowley, 33 degree Freemason, leader of the Ordo Templi Orientis, black magician, Satanist, the Beast 666, L. Ron Hubbard, mass mind controller, black magician, Satanist, founder of the Church of Scientology cult, Werner von Bruen, who we talked about, and Mr. Walt Disney, who everybody knows about, <clears throat> who's also a known Illuminati and uh, helped with the pedophile um, Magic Kingdom 33 and all the underground caves at Disney and the mind control programming. So it's quite a group that founded NASA here. Additionally, in 1958, we find that the first solar panels were created. Again, the Arctic Treaty System was founded. The United Nations was founded. Uh, few know that the U.S. deployed atomic weapons or said to have deployed atomic weapons in 1958 in Korea at the end of the Korean War, again, probably to promote the Red Scare. Uh, and then just uh, we have the Van Allen Belt discovery by ex satellite explorers 1 and 3. Uh, and then very interestingly, uh, the United States completed six high-altitude nuclear tests in 1958, but they raised a number of questions. According to the U.S. government report, quote, previous high-altitude nuclear tests, the teak, the orange, and the yucca, plus three Argus shots were poorly instrumented and hastily executed. Despite thorough studies of the meager data, present models of these bursts are sketchy and tentative. When they got up to the Van Allen belts, did they lose communications? Uh, 1961, uh, nuclear test ban is lifted with Russia to test high altitude weapons. Now, why did they lift the ban when we're beginning to enter into a space race? Uh, the Antarctic Treaty System is ratified and signed. Uh, the ASPA, which is the uh, Antarctic Special Protection Agency, uh, could be a, a protecting the heart facilities down there. Uh, JFK announces space mission to the moon. Cosmonaut Yuri Gergen became the first human in space. Alan Shepard, the first American in space in a 15-minute suborbital flight. Uh, and few are aware that Russia is said to have launched an explorer probe to Venus. And even fewer are aware that in a speech, J.F. Kennedy stated that there's already a satellite from the United States heading to Venus in 1961. We'll be sure we are behind and will be behind for some time in manned flight. But we do not intend to stay behind, and in this decade, we shall make up and move ahead. This is a breathtaking pace, and such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old. New ignorance, new problems, new dangers. So, nuking the dome, 1962, Operation Dominic. Operation Don Dominic was a series of 31 nuclear test explosions conducted in 1962. It occurred during a period of the high Cold War tension between the United States and the Soviet Union. Also, the Bay of Pigs invasion had occurred just re recently and was on the minds as well. Uh, Khrushchev announced the end of the three-year moratorium on nuclear testing on August 30th, 1961. And immediately thereafter, on September 1st, he initiated a series of tests that included the initiation of SAR bombs up into the upper atmosphere. Kennedy responded immediately by authorizing Operation Dominic, the largest nuclear weapons testing program ever conducted by the United States and the last atmosphere, atmospheric test series conducted by the U.S. as a limited test ban treaty was signed in Moscow the following year. So this small, small window they start blasting up in space with thermonuclear weapons. Um, what were they doing? Why were they doing this? What were they trying to find? Dominic was the largest and most elaborate testing operation ever conducted. The diagnostic stations receiving data from the test covered more than 15 million square miles, 28,000 military and civilian personnel, 200 tons, tons of supplies were shipped and airlifted to the test areas. 
This was a major, major operation, just like down to the Antarctic. In the exact same time period, Russia is also testing the dome. Uh, the Soviet Union's K project was a group of five nuclear tests conducted in 1961-62. They were all high-altitude tests fired by missiles of the Kasputin Yard launch site in Russia. Uh, Operation Fishbowl was 10 shots within five months. Uh, they were Operation Fishbowl was to be bluegill, starfish, and araka. If the tests were to fail, the next attempt of the same test would be of the same name plus the word prime. They were intent on testing the dome. The first planned test of Fishbowl was June 2nd, 1962. Uh, no nuclear detonation occurred, no data was attained. So continuing from 1958, they're having rockets uh, go out and just lose their uh, uh, way and uh, instruments go haywire and they have to detonate it. We see this time again. Uh, Operation Starfish, June 19th, 1962. Uh, missile flew a normal trajectory for 59 seconds and the rocket engine suddenly stopped. The uh, range officer ordered the destruction of the missile. Some of the missile's parts fell on Johnston Island. Some of the debris was contaminated with plutonium. Lovely. Starfish Prime. The Thor missile, this is important, the Thor missile carrying the Starfish Prime warhead actually reached an apogee, maximum height, of just over 680 miles. Remember that, 680 miles. And the warhead was detonated on its downward trajectory when it had fallen to the programmed altitude of 250 miles. Now, why would you send something up 680 miles and detonate it down at 250 miles? Now, also note that all of these tests were conducted at night, mostly at midnight, in the dark of night. They wanted to see what was up there. Starfish Prime, this is very important too, Starfish Prime caused an electromagnetic pulse, which was far larger than expected so much larger that it drove much of the instrumentation off the scale, causing great difficulty in getting accurate me measurements. Uh, the pulse also made effects known to the public by causing electrical damage in Hawaii some 900 miles away from the detonation point, knocking out 300 street lights, setting off numerous burger alarms, damaging telephone, microwave links. They had microwave back, there, back then, folk, 1961. The visible phenomena due to the burst were widespread and quite intense. A very large area of the Pacific was illuminated by the auroral phenomenon. Resonant scattering of light from lithium, another wonderful uh, metal braining down on us, and other debris was observed at Johnson and French frigate shoals for many days, confirming the long-time presence of debris in the atmosphere. The starfish prime radiation belt persisted at high altitude for many months and damaged United States satellites. All of these satellites failed completely within several months of the starfish detonation. So we have an electromagnetic pulse that's sending all communication devices haywire and they're having to destroy and uh, fail all of their satellites and missiles. All right, so as of the beginning of 2011, the EMP waveforms and prompt gamma radiation outputs for Bluegill Triple Prime, they had to get to Triple Prime and their testing. Uh, in an unclassified report, however, a subsequent theory, which is now one being used, was developed which describes the mechanism by which the high altitude EMP is generated. Uh, data to confirm the EMP theory is still classified. Uh, a very large number of United States military and ships were operating in support of Prime. Uh, in addition, they had some guests. An uninvited scientific expeditionary ship from the Soviet Union was stationed near Johnson Island for the test, and another Soviet scientific expeditionary ship was located in the southern Kunjagat region. They were working together, folks. Uh, this is very important, too. The electromagnetic pulse generated by a high-altitude nuclear explosion appeared to have very significant differences from the electromagnetic pulse generated by the nuclear explosions closer to the surface. So something up high changed the profile of the electromagnetic patterns. It was known from previous high-altitude tests as well as from theoretical work done in the 50s that high-altitude nuclear tests produce a number of unique geophysical phenomena at the opposite end of the magnetic field line of the Earth's magnetic field. So then in 1963, they quickly signed with the Russians, a nuclear air test ban treaty is signed, um, pro prohibiting all test detonations of nuclear weapons except underground. Shortly thereafter, JFK is assassinated, how convenient. Nikola Tesla, there is no energy and matter 
other than that received from the environment. Okay people, my name is Dana. This is my very first YouTube video ever. Um, I've got something here that I don't quite understand and I'm hoping maybe someone out there can explain it to me. I've been doing a lot of research on um, the flat earth and the firmament, uh, things like that. This is um, a set of encyclopedias I have. Um, they're Encyclopedia Americana. Um, this is volume two. It's the A's. What we're going to do is look at what it says about Antarctica. Um, these, just remember, this, uh, this is a 1958 edition. Okay, this was before the Antarctic Treaty was signed. Um, this was before the supposed Apollo missions. Um, I want to show you something that it says in here about Antarctica. It basically talks about um, all the exploration. It says here, Antarctic region, regions, excuse me, um, all the exploration. Um, it has a few, few photos, not too many. This is um, the map created back then. I've read all of this. This is the part here that I have the question about. I am trying my best to get some light on here really good. Um, like I said, this is my first video. Don't criticize me too much. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing. Let's see. Okay, I hope you can see this. They did flights, and it says, These flights prove the inland areas to be featureless in character with a dome 13,000 feet high at about latitude 80 degrees south, longitude 90 degrees east. Okay, I have no idea what that means. There seems to be only one definition for the word dome. Um, anyway, if uh, anybody has any idea what this means, can explain this to me, I would appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Space. All systems are go for launch. You might have 10 seconds. 
there's another recent article that just uh, uh, I found. Uh, I think it was on the 14th, um, and I posted it on Facebook called "Are They Finding the Firmament?" Now I, I, I start out with uh, meanwhile, as people suffering from severe cases of impenetrable cognitive dissidents who think that discussing what the Bible has to say concerning our Earth and its place in the cosmos is a waste of time, scientists at MIT may be confirming the scriptures right in front of us, for us. This is a quote from an article uh, taken from ibtimes.com, and I've got the link there for that. Uh, it says, the Earth is protected from fast-moving killer electrons by an invisible plasma shield which is located thousands of miles above the planet's surface, according to researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and the University of Colorado Boulder. High above the Earth's atmosphere, harmful electrons that make up the outer band of the Van Allen radiation belt travel at nearly the speed of light, pelting everything in their path. Exposure to such high-energy radiation can harm satellite electronics and pose serious health risks to astronauts. However, despite their intense energy, these electrons circling around the planet's equator cannot come below 7,200 miles from the Earth's surface due to the shield, scientists said in a study published in the journal Nature on Thursday. It's almost like these electrons are running into a glass wall in space, Daniel Baker of the University of Colorado Boulder and the study's lead author said in a statement. Somewhat like the shields created by force fields in Star Trek that were used to repel alien weapons, we are seeing an invisible shield blocking these electrons. It's an extremely puzzling phenomenon. The invisible shield, dubbed the plasmospheric hiss, is made up of very low frequency electromagnetic waves in the Earth's upper atmosphere. Scientific data and calculations have helped researchers deduce that the hiss deflects incoming electrons, causing them to smash into neutral gas atoms in the Earth's upper atmosphere and ultimately disappear. It's a very unusual, extraordinary, and pronounced phenomenon, John Foster, associate director of MIT's Haystack Observatory, said in a statement. What this tells us is if you parked a satellite or an orbiting space station with humans just inside this impenetrable barrier you would expect them to have much longer lifetimes. That's a good thing to know. The latest study is based on data collected by NASA's Van Allen probes that are orbiting within the harsh environments of the Van Allen radiation belt. Oh, you mean the one that they just flew through, no problem, back in the 60s? Huh, in the 70s? During the study, the researchers observed an, quote, exceedingly sharp barrier, end quote, against harmful electrons, which was steady enough to withstand a solar wind shock in October 2013. To determine what could create and maintain such a barrier, the researchers considered a few possibilities, including effects from the Earth's magnetic field and radio signals from human transmitters on Earth. Oh, yeah, (laughs) it's our Walkman that's causing this. Whatever. Um, You know, and there's another article I should post uh, where they're saying they want to, they basically want to, uh, poke a hole or, or blow up or eliminate even the Van Allen belts. Okay, check this out. February 27, 2014, okay, last year. Physicists plan to wipe out Earth's Van Allen belts with radio waves. You got a depiction here of the Van Allen belts, what they look like here. It was just last year that physicists thought they had found the origin of Earth's Van Allen radiation belts. And now a prominent group of them wants those belts dead. It's understandable, given the frustration these areas of space can cause to modern astrophysicists. If you want to launch a satellite or a telescope, let alone a human being, the Van Allen belts will be a painful thorn in your side. So, says a growing group of astrophysicists, why not wipe them out altogether? It might seem odd to hear scientists propose destroying a feature of the natural world, but there is a decent scientific argument to be made that these belts provide us nothing useful and that we could lose them without a single negative effect. These guys, they think they came from monkeys, okay? This is the way the Earth is, okay, all flat Earth globe arguments aside, okay, it's understandable, at least as far as we've been told, that there is a belt of radiation over us. 
And this belt of radiation apparently helps to protect us from other harmful things coming our way from the sun or what have you. You know, regardless of whether the Earth is a globe or flat, everybody seems to agree that these belts are, are good for us. You know, uh, that they're doing something. They're, they were intended to be there. This place was created with these things around us for a reason. Okay? And these knuckleheads, hey, I think we should just blow it up. I don't really think it's important. Eh, I don't know what it does, so let's, uh, let's uh, blow it up. And, and it's not the first time. They wanted to do that. In fact, you could go do a Google search on going nuclear over the Pacific, smithsonian.com, and uh, learn about Starfish Prime and Operation Fishbowl and all that. It says your knowledge of radiation in space was still fragmentary and new. It was only four years before that. James Van Allen, a University of Iowa physicist who had been experimenting with Geiger counters on satellites, claimed to have discovered that the Earth was encircled by a deadly band of X-rays. And that radiation from the sun hit the satellites so rapidly and furiously that the devices jammed. Van Allen announced his findings on May 1st, 1958. Go back and look at what was going on in 1956 through 58, specifically what was going on in Antarctica with uh, Operation High Jump and Operation Deep Freeze. And then everybody pulled out of Antarctica, signs the, they all signed the Antarctic Treaty, and NASA's then created, and all of a sudden Van Allen, you know, does this little experiment when they start shooting stuff up in the space, and he finds the Van Allen belts uh, at a joint meeting meeting of the of the National Academy of Sciences and American Physical Society and the following day the Chicago Tribune bannered the headline radiation belt dims hope of space travel the story continued death lurking in a belt of unexpectedly heavy radiation about 700 miles above the earth today dim man's dream of conquering outer space okay so this was early on in the, in, in the creation of NASA and the whole space program. This is, it's 1958, it's even before Kennedy made his announcement to want to go to the moon. But yet 700 miles above the Earth is this thing that seems to prohibit that. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. What? As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. One more time. An area of dangerous radiation. Oh. What's wrong with that radiation? Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. That doesn't sound good. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. What? We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space? I thought this problem was solved over 40 years ago when he sent a bunch of people in jumpsuits and tin cans through it there and back a half dozen times. Oh, oh, but I forgot. The uh, the Apollo guys, the, they were clueless uh, regarding the radiation belt. Uh, that It didn't affect them. I don't know the distance to the Van Allen radiation belt. And if we did, it wasn't a problem. We, if we were going to encounter it, then we would have had to build the spacecraft and the spacesuit to, uh, to, to not give humans a problem. You, you don't just build something and hope it works. You study to see what uh, the threats are, the environment is, and then you say, how thick do I have to make the metal on the spacecraft so that going through this kind of radiation or these kind of meteoroids, it won't get hurt. And so and then we build it that way. manage the Orion crew and service module office. Um, we're responsible for developing the crew capsule, which is where the crew lives and works when they're in space, um, and the service module, which is what provides the, the power and the fuel um, and the consumables then that is plumbed over to uh, the crew module. Uh, so right now I focus a lot of my time on the development of uh, the life support system uh, for the Orion crew module. 
Space puts us in a different environment. When we're here on Earth, we're, we don't realize every day we're protected by the environment around us. We're, our bodies are at a certain pressure, we're protected by the natural radiation shield of the Earth. Um, and when we go out into space and we don't have that natural protection, then um, the engineering and the spacecraft have to provide that protection for us. We don't have the ultimate answer for radiation on Orion. We're still working on that. Um, you know, if we were to build Orion out of the materials we need and the sole job was to protect for the radiation environment, the vehicle would really be too heavy. So we have to balance the weight of the materials that we put on the spacecraft um, with how much protection it's providing the crew. So we're really looking at it from an operational perspective. If we um, understand a radiation event has happened, the crew will actually take shelter in the aft bay of the vehicle, which is kind of down in the back end. Um, and we'll use some of the stowage things that are around them in that back end to kind of protect them from the radiation. Uh, we have found over the years that uh, water is a really great radiation absorbing material. Um, so we could do things like uh, water that's already there in the water bags for drinking and things like that, that, that water could be used to shield them. Uh, as well as we had some concepts like a, a water field vest that they could put on should they, um, should they know there's an event and need to be protected. We don't have a, um, a clue when it comes to like how to protect them from like radiation. So we're going to just like put them up there in like a water suits. Yeah, we like water suits and, and like if they, we put water all around them, you know, so the radiation could go like into the water and then, you know, they could drink it and it could be like a fantastic four. Everybody comes, be, be, they'll come back and be mutants when they get back. But, but we, we just got some ideas, you know, yeah. But don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, I know there are refugees everywhere and like people are starving and stuff and like we have homeless all over the place. But if we spend like a few trillion dollars, um, I think we should be able to figure out how to make um, water suits for the astronauts in space. And um, then maybe it'll work out like it did for the guys in Apollo. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells. Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside, and we didn't get any, you know, added radiation. Yeah, if you pretend that it's not really there, then you can, you can just go right through it. So apparently you had this magic window of time, because now Orion's still very much concerned about it. We've got to solve this challenge before we can put people through it. And yet before, even before uh, uh, Mercury and Gemini, they were very concerned about it and trying to figure out how to solve the problem, as evidenced in this Smithsonian.com article. News of the hot band of peril immediately cast down on whether Leica, the Russian dog, would have been able to survive for a week in space aboard Sputnik. Sputnik 2, as the Soviets claimed in November of 1957. The Soviets said that after six days, the dog's oxygen ran out and he was euthanized with poisoned food. It was later learned that Leica, the first live animal to be launched into space, died just hours after the launch from overheating and stress when a malfunction in the capsule caused the temperature to rise. What Van Allen had discovered were the bands of high energy particles that were held in place by strong magnetic fields and soon known as the Van Allen belts. A year later, he appeared on the cover of Time magazine as he opened an entirely new field of research, magnetospheric physics, and catapulted the United States into the race to space with the Soviet Union. On the same day, Van Allen held his press conference in May 1958. He agreed to cooperate with the United States military on a top secret project. The plan? To send atomic bombs into space in an attempt to blow up the Van Allen belts or to at least disrupt them with a massive blast of nuclear energy. Okay, guys, read up on this stuff. All right, this is Smithsonian.com. Check that out. Um, there's another good article on NPR. You can look up a, a very scary light show exploding H-bombs in space um, when they talk about this. And they, they got a video here showing uh, footage of uh, Operation Fishbowl, which is a very interesting title for um, after they find something in Antarctica, which the Flat Earthers would say is the outer rim of the circle of the Earth. And everybody pulls out. All of a sudden, NASA is created. And right after that, they start shooting up rockets into space um, with uh, nuclear warheads on them. 
And this is what you start seeing with Operation Fishbowl. Operation Fishbowl. Really? I mean, it looks like they found something in Antarctica, and they said, oh, what is this? wonder how high it is. How high does this thing go? And they start blowing off nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. Now, were they doing that because they were testing the firmament? Were they trying to bl blast through the firmament? Or, or, or is it about the Van Allen belt with the radiation? Is that the problem? I don't know. The, this article goes on to describe, uh, again, the Van Allen energy belts and what they came to understand about them and discover it, then blow it up. The plan was to send rockets hundreds of miles up higher than the Earth's atmosphere and then detonate nuclear weapons to see, A, if a bomb's radiation would make it harder to see what was up there, like incoming Russian missiles, B, if an explosion would do any damage to objects nearby, C, if the Van Allen belts would move a blast down the bands to an earthly target, Moscow, for example. And most peculiar, D, if a man-made explosion might alter the natural shape of the belts. The scientific basis for these proposals is not clear. Fleming is trying to figure out if Van Allen had any theoretical reason to suppose the military could use the Van Allen belts to attack a hostile nation. He supposes that at the height of the Cold War, the most pressing argument for a military experiment was, if we don't do it, the Russians will. And indeed, the Russians did test atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs in space. No big surprise. They were also down there in Antarctica prior. And oh, by the way, while, while we supposedly got ahead of them and started to beat them in the alleged space race, you know, we're, we're led to believe they just, oh, oh, we lost and they gave up. No, they sent like something like 40 missions down to Antarctica while we were playing around with the so-called Apollo space program. So something's going on here, and these psychopaths, you know, they go, they look up there, they see something. Oh, that looks cool. Let's blow it up. Oh, we don't really think it's important. Even though they have admitted that they know it's there for our protection, uh, why do we put our fate into the hands of monkey men? These people think they came from monkeys, for crying out loud. And they, they hold within their grasp technology that could make life for us here on Earth very bad when they do things like they're attempting to do at CERN, to rip holes in the fabric of time and space and recreate what they think is the Big Bang, opening up portals into interdimensional you know, realms. And, and now keep in mind, these monkey men think that the whole universe got here when a microscopic dot exploded. So what are they doing? They're slamming microscopic dots together, trying to recreate the Big Bang. Uh, I don't really think it takes a very high IQ to uh, think that through. Wait a minute. You think we got here from a microscopic dot exploding, and now you're slamming microscopic dots together uh, trying to explode them and re uh, recreate the Big Bang. Uh, hello? Guys, maybe there's a reason why they put the Hindu god Shiva, the god of destruction, dancing in a portal outside their front freaking door. Bunch of lunatics. And meanwhile, elsewhere, a bunch of other lunatic psychopaths are thinking they can poke holes or blow up uh, the Van Allen belt, the very thing that's up there, put there for our protection. You know, people out there thinking I'm crazy? Anyway, let's go back to the original IBTimes.com article regarding the uh, invisible plasma shield. The last quote here says, it's like looking at the phenomenon with new eyes, with a new set of instrumentation, which give us the detail to say, yes, there is this hard, fast boundary, Foster said. Hmm. Have they found the firmament? I don't know. I mean, it's not exactly the description of the firmament, but uh, if it's not the firmament, it may be one of the heavens in the layers below it. But whatever the case may be, the choice of words being used, as I've stressed here in bold, uh, above, seems more than interesting to me. A hard, fast boundary that is an impenetrable barrier out there about 7,200 miles up? Note also the repeated statements about how harsh space is and in and beyond the Van Allen belts. And yet we were told NASA sent a bunch of guys in jumpsuits and a tin can through it 12 times round trip on at least a half dozen alleged missions to the moon. Job 37.18 says, Hast thou with him spread out the sky which is strong as a molten looking glass? Amos 
nine six in the New American Standard Bible says, "The one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth, he who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name." There may yet be a legitimate reason people are going back to the scriptures in order to see and test slash prove First Thessalonians five twenty one, the truth for themselves.